tu attends quelque chose, Michel Hein Tu attends quelque chose euh... Ah bon, c'est là-bas que ça va se passer Non, non, c'est ici, mais c'est la présentation d'abord officielle. Et après, vous allez... Après, après, euh, avec les les les... Ben, on arrête pour une minute pour que les, euh, les gens qui vont parler ce soit ah ici. Bon Alors, d'accord, oui. on commence. Oui, oui. Est-ce qu'on peut commencer Can we begin I have chosen today to deal with a rather narrow aspect which, however, does have the advantage of being amenable to chronological and thematic demarcation. And the question that I want to present to your attention today is what did the British Foreign Office know about the events of 1933 in Ukraine? and what responses did it make to this information. I propose to look at this question, the information that the British Foreign Office had in 1933 in chronological order, and to deal only with the year of 1933. This is not, does not mean, of course, that the famine began on January 1st, 1933, and ended on <coughs> December the 31st. Thanks to its political, economic, and diplomatic power, Great Britain was, in the 1930s, with the exception of Germany, probably the best informed great power in Europe. Its information about Eastern Europe, including Ukraine, came from a variety of sources. These sources included the staff of the British Embassy and Consulate in Moscow and of the British Consulate in Leningrad, Information from the diplomats of other countries, particularly Germany, with whom British diplomats had very close, cordial, personal relations. Reports, private reports by foreign correspondents stationed in, in Moscow. The British Foreign Office also regularly received very precise and exhaustive summaries of both the Soviet and Western press, anything to do with the Soviet Union was brought to the attention of uh, Whitehall officials. Finally, there were contacts with Soviet residents, and there was information presented to Whitehall by Ukrainian representatives in the West. Let us look at this information in chronological order. The first mention of the famine in 1933 occurs on 13 January. Summarizing an article about agriculture in the first five-year plan, which appeared in the Moscow Daily News, the Moscow Chancery reports to London, I quote, in 1928, the state collected as grain quotas 11 million tons. In 1931, it got 23 million tons. Hence, probably, the present famine, end of quote. On 13 February, Edward Coote, a member of the staff of the embassy in Moscow, informed Sir John Simon, the permanent secretary of understate for foreign affairs, that Pavel Postashev had been appointed secretary of the CPU. He wrote, Postashev was previously a member of the Central Committee and of the Org Bureau, and in a sense, Stalin's chief of cabinet. His new appointment, therefore, appears to be connected with the forthcoming purge of the Ukrainian party, which has already found its first victims among several important Ukrainian party officials whose dismissal has been announced as a result of the recent session of the CPU. On 5 March, Sir Esmond Ovi, the British ambassador to Moscow, sent a cable to London in which he wrote, Meanwhile, internal situation is not promising. Conditions in Kuban have been described to me by recent English visitor as appalling and as resembling an armed camp in a desert. No work, no grain, no cattle, no, no draft horses, only idle peasants or soldiers. Another correspondent who had visited Kuban was strongly dissuaded from visiting the Ukraine, where conditions are apparently as bad, although apathy is greater. In fact, all correspondents have now been advised, and that word was placed in inverted commas, have now been advised by the press department of the Commissariat for Foreign Affairs to remain in Moscow. Expulsions and arrests are the order of the day, and this morning names of 40 officials arrested for agricultural sabotage have been published in the press. While the government is still reported strong, acute observers feel dictatorship has outrun general views of the party, 
and the country under Stalin is now almost exclusively controlled by army and secret police, regardless of any councils of moderation." End of quote. On 27 March, the British Embassy in Moscow reported to the Foreign Office that it has been receiving letters which reveal the gen general conditions in the Soviet Union. I quote from the summary of these letters forwarded to London. The first is from a Russian, now in the Ukraine, who lived for many years in Canada and writes as follows. After my father's death, my mother wrote and asked me to come back and in 1922 I returned to Russia. In 1926, my mother died. I buried her and then lived neither rich nor poor. We were four souls, four hectares of land, one horse and one cow, and so I lived until 1932 when I was dekulakized, my house taken, and I and my family put under the open sky. End of the quote within the quote. Now the embassy proceeds to summarize other letters and to comment on them. There is no doubt that both the embassy and the consulate receive considerably more of these letters than at any time since the present mis mission was established. They become more and more frequent, and it is only a small proportion of the more sane and succinct that we report to you. Each document in the Foreign Office files contains a cover sheet which provides room for handwritten comments and annotations by Whitehall officials. The note on the cover sheet to this dispatch is of particular interest. These letters, I quote, serve to confirm the articles of Mr. Gareth Jones at present appearing in the Daily Express. Gareth Jones, to put the matter very briefly, ex investigated the famine by the simple expedient of packing a knapsack with as much tin food as he could carry and setting out on foot to explore the Kharkiv region in March of 1933. On his return, he presented his findings at a press conference in Berlin and then at a lecture at Chatham House in London and in a series of articles in the Daily Express. And in all of these, he gave the most gruesome account of conditions in Ukraine. On April 21st, Strang, a staff member of the British Embassy in Moscow, wrote to Sir John Simon the following. I have the honor to report that an increasing number of stories of varying reliability are now reaching the embassy regarding the sufferings of the population in the Soviet Union. The following is a selection from them. Letters have been addressed to the embassy begging for England's help against the present regime. One of these, from the Ukraine, states that the communist administration has ruined the working people and has reduced them to starvation, barbarity, and even cannibalism. After the words, England, save us who are dying of hunger, help us to get rid of the Bolsheviks, the letter is signed by the Committee of 100, and a postscript adds, O oh, Mr. Ambassador, we cannot express in a letter all our misery. We are being forced to cannibalism by our workers' government of desperates. Save us. I continue to quote Strang writing to John Simon. The commercial counselor has received the enclosed specimens of the so-called human food on which the peasants are existing in some parts of the country. One of these was cattle cake, which was being sold, it is said, for human consumption at eight rubles for a piece about eight inches by six inches, and another was a dark brown substance which was said to be made for human consumption with the aid of the oil pressed from cattle cake. It seems clear that in most parts of the country, the euphemism bread has lost its meaning and is being used to cover these varied forms of doubtful provender. A British subject, I am still quoting, a British subject named Richter, already known to His Majesty's Consul General as of a good type, told the following story when on a recent visit to Leningrad. He broke down while telling it and for some time could not continue. At Armavir in the Kubany, where he has now been living, the workers' ration in the factory is 400 grams of bread a day and nothing else. All the people have swollen faces and bodies and limbs from having too little or injurious food to eat. The corpses of people who have died of hunger can often be seen. The, a handwritten note on the cover sheet to this document indicates that it was distributed to the king, the cabinet, and the dominions. In the course of 1933, I found two such documents. I'll mention the second one later. And there is a note on this document saying, comment is unnecessary, except perhaps to observe that the USSR is the one country where there is no overproduction. And then a co note in a different hand. Comment is indeed <coughs> needless. On May 5th, 
Strang informed Sir John Simon that the Central Committee and the Central Con Control Commission had issued a decree concerning the party purge that was to take place later in the year. He wrote about this. One of the forms of demoralization which is to be dealt with by expulsion from the party is personal <coughs> contact with foreign elements by which class enemies are presumably meant. My own opinion in this matter is that this was to prevent party members from talking to foreign journalists. More about that later. On May 12th, Strang informed Simon that the passport system, which previously had applied to Moscow, Leningrad, and Kharkiv, and the 50 or 100 kilometer zone around them, was now being applied to a number of other cities, among them Kiev, Odessa, Rostov, Sevastopol, Stalino, and Dnipropetrovsk and to inhabited settlements within a 100 kilometer belt on the Western European frontier of the USSR. Comment by a foreign office official, only good communists are to be allowed to live in the large towns or on the Western frontier. On May 15th, Strang again wrote to Simon about unsolicited letters from Soviet correspondents received by the embassy. Such letters, he said, are increasing regularly. The motives of their authors are obscure, he wrote, but it is significant that the number of letters increases as the economic crisis in this country becomes more acute. In the last week, an anonymous letter has been received which opens as follows. We request you, Mr. Representative, to approach your government for our protection and with the object of saving the starving people of the USSR, who are living on all kinds of rotten stuff, carrion, marmots, and cannibalism and concludes by declaring that we are perishing and you are being appealed to by thousands of hungry peasants and workers in the USSR. According to this letter, Strang continued, if collective farmers take one or two pounds of grain to make kasha, they are sentenced to 10 years, and already 60% of collective farmers have been prosecuted and are serving compulsory labor in some camp or other. Strang then proceeded to wonder in his dispatch to London, London whether such letters were sent abroad to foreign newspapers, and if so, why they were not being translated and published. They would provide, he said, a not unfair antidote to the only information regarding living conditions which is sent directly from the Soviet Union in the form of news from foreign journalists who are compelled to be discreet or contained in such an organ as the Moscow Daily News. Leslie Collier, member of the Foreign Office in London, commented on this. I have been told by journalists that letters of this sort are often sent, usually indirectly, through recipients here to newspaper offices, but that editors seldom publish them, though I have seen some in the press, partly because it is difficult to convince skeptics of their authenticity, but mainly because it is thought that public opinion is already convinced that appalling conditions exist in Russia, except for that se section of the public which is pro-Soviet, that nothing will convince it." End of quotation. On June 1st, Strang again informed Sir John Simon that Soviet citizens were continuing to write or visit the embassy, offering information. One caller, he wrote, I quote, who appeared at the embassy a week or two ago, began abruptly by saying that the information he had to offer would be interesting to the embassy in view of the deterioration of Anglo-Soviet relations. His materials related to the widespread famine which affected certain districts from which he had just returned and regarding which the world was in utter ignorance. He was then told that the embassy was not in want of further information and left with reluctance." End of quotation. To the credit of the Foreign Office, Sir Van Sittert reprimanded the embassy for having turned away such information. No instructions have ever been given, he wrote, as far as I know, to the embassy at Moscow to discourage callers desirous of giving information. On the contrary, it will be seen from, and he names a certain document, that we asked the Chancery to send us copies of any interesting letters they received. I will write to the Chancery and give them this criticism. On 19 June, the Moscow Chancery again forwarded to the Foreign Office translations of more letters from Soviet citizens, noting that it could send further batches of letters and inquiring whether London had any use for them. In this batch was an unsigned letter from Ukraine addressed to the British ambassador. Quote, 
Our whole Soviet press comments at all times very truthfully and in great detail upon all circumstances of current Soviet life. But probably owing to lack of space, has not mentioned that in the Ukraine millions of the population have died from hunger. The population would be glad to eat carrion, but there is none to be found. People are eating frogs. They are digging up horses that have died from glanders and are also eating them. And finally, they have not only invented the method of killing and eating each other, but also dig up dead bodies and eat them. The above mentioned details can be verified by anyone in the Zlatopolsk area. Taking advantage of Soviet liberty, you or your correspondent can be told about this by anybody, and you will see tens of dead bodies in any village. End of that letter. On June 21st, Leslie Pott, the vice British Vice Consul at Leningrad, had a conversation with C.C. Farrer of the Department of Overseas Trade, in which he told him that, I quote, conditions in the Soviet Union were becoming almost incredibly bad. While conditions were bad enough in Leningrad, he had heard from his German colleagues who had several posts in South Russia that conditions in the Ukraine and South Russia were even worse. End of the quotation. In order to draw him out, continued Farrer, who was summarizing this conversation for London, I asked him whether it was not possible that stories of starvation and famine in South Russia were exaggerated. I said one had even heard guarded allusions to the practice of cannibalism. He said that this was by no means an exaggeration, and though he had not seen it with his own eyes, he had heard from residents in South Russia that such practices were occurring sporadically. He said that all the signs seemed to point to a famine. Only this time, he added, there will be no American relief mission to save life. Even then, he doubted whether the effect of a few hundred thousand lives being lost would sensibly affect the regime at present in power. End of quote. Comment on the cover sheet to this document. I quote, Mr. Pott's remarks as regards conditions in Russia tally with the reports we have had from other sources, and I expect the opinion expressed in the last sentence is correct. 25 July, Strang informed Whitehall that 12 persons charged with offenses under Article 58, the infamous Article 58, were tried before the Moscow City Court. The 12 accused, all of peasant origin, had between about the middle of 1932 and the beginning of 1933 concealed kulaks who had come to Moscow and supplied them with false documents and organized counter-revolutionary activities in the restaurants where they were employed. The quality of the food, according to the charge made against the 12, the quality of the food became bad and the portions smaller, rotten potatoes and vegetables were used in the preparation of dishes and foreign materials such as powdered glass, sand, hair, nails and wire were found in the food. End of the official charges against the 12. What is of interest here is the comment by Whitehall officials. I suppose this trial, wrote one, serves its political purpose of providing more excuses for the shortcomings of the communist regime. But it is hard to believe that even the Russian public can swallow this story of sabotage in the kitchen. End of quotation. Added another official, they have to swallow all sorts of incredible and inedible things from Soviet kitchens. On 17 July, Strang sent to Simon a dispatch entirely about the famine. I quote, It is hardly necessary, wrote Strang, to confirm the notorious fact that on the eve of the harvest, conditions of semi-famine still continue to obtain over large areas of the Soviet Union. Unauthorized estimates of the number of people who have died either directly or indirectly from malnutrition in the past year, vary up to as much as the fantastic figure of 10 million. It is, I think, quite impossible to guess what the figure may be. I am told by a member of the German embassy that in the German agricultural concession in the North Caucasus, five men have been employed in gathering and burying the corpses of peasants who have come in from outside this oasis of plenty in search of food and have died. One of the erectors employed by metropolitan vicars in the Ukraine say, says that people died of starvation in the block of apartments in which he lived, one of them outside his door. He says that he refused to believe the stories he heard of conditions in the villages outside and walked out to see for himself. He found, as he had been told, that some villages were completely deserted, the population having died or fled, and that corpses were lying about the houses and streets. His Majesty's Consul in Moscow is occasionally visited by Canadians of Russian origin, settled in the Ukraine, 
who tell him the same dreary, if less lurid, story of want, hopelessness, and desolation. In Moscow itself, signs of malnutrition are not widespread. The population, especially in the center of the town, where the privileged classes congregate, looks healthy and fairly to adequately nourished. In the outer fringes of the town where the workers live, and especially round the railway stations, the picture is more depressing. For here the poorer classes are seen in the mass, and here the destitute peasants from the country are wont to congregate. Even in Moscow itself, which is favored above all places in the Union in the matter of food, there are deaths from starvation. An English lady who is studying Soviet hospitality and welfare work has herself come upon two corpses in the streets of persons who had just died as a direct result of lack of food. Such is the condition of the country, continued Strang, in the first year of the second five-year plan, on the eve of the fourth collectivized harvest. It is one which causes the authorities some preoccupation, but little apprehension or alarm. The suffering and death inflicted upon the population are regarded as the normal casualties of a nationwide operation in class warfare, a class war to end classes, in which the authorities are confident that victory will be theirs. End of quotation. What is of particular interest here is not the report itself. It confirms numerous other eyewitness accounts, but the interpretation placed upon it in London. I quote, this dispatch gives a gloomy picture of living conditions in the USSR, writes a foreign office official on the cover sheet. It is clear that real famine exists in many country districts and that the Soviet government are not particularly concerned about it. On 2 August, the Duchess of Athol sent to the foreign office an anonymous report <coughs> entitled The Northern Caucasus in the Spring of 1933. One foreign office official wrote that this article gives a gruesome picture of famine conditions in the North Caucasus, and it would be interesting to know something more of the writer. It looks to me, wrote a second official, as if the article, which is dated Moscow, May 23rd, was written by a companion of Dr. Schiller, the German agricultural attaché, who I believe was recently in the North Caucasus. Several months later, an article by Dr. Schiller was in fact published in the Daily Telegraph. The text is identical with, with this summary in the Foreign Office, and thus we can establish that this report was written by Otto Schiller. It is, I think, the best report, the most detailed, most complete report on the situation in the Soviet Union, in the agricultural districts, Ukraine, North Caucasus, etc., in 1933. On 4 August, the Foreign Office received a memorandum by the British Consul at Moscow, giving an account of the conditions in the infamous White Sea Canal works. The memorandum gives us a good idea of what the laborers, many of, them who, many of whom were Ukrainian peasants, were fed. I quote, Work was done on the payment by result system, i.e., the amount of rations received dependent on the manner in which the allotted task was completed. For this purpose, the workers became divided into three classes, first, second, and third. The first class consisted of those who were 130% efficient, the second of the 100% efficients, and the third of the 75% efficients. Before going to work in the morning at 6 a.m., a spoonful of cold porridge was served, the size of the spoon being different for each class of worker. Work lasted without a break until 4 p.m., when it finished for the day. The first class then received 1,300 grams of bread each, the second 1,000 grams, and the third 500 grams. In addition, they received weak fish soup and a little porridge, again according to class, the third class being excluded from the porridge. They also received a small ration of sugar occasionally and some unrecognizable product which was termed tea." End of quotation. I have seen accounts, wrote a foreign office official, I have seen accounts of worse conditions than these in other labor camps. So far as food is concerned, these people seem to be better off than the peasants in the Ukraine and Northern Caucasus. In the summer of 1933, a Ukrainian National Council in Canada was formed in Winnipeg. One of its first acts was to address a plea for famine relief to Ramsay MacDonald, then Prime Minister of Great Britain. The plea drew attention to the systematic starvation of the population of eastern Ukraine under Bolshevik occupation, pointed out that the cause of the famine was not crop failure, but Moscow's policy of exporting the farmers' grain, and begged MacDonald to take the necessary steps to arrange for an immediate neutral investigation of the famine situation in Ukraine. 
with a view to organizing international relief for the stricken population. And closed with the letter was supporting material, including an interview with a Marie Jouk, who had very recently emigrated from the Odessa district to join her husband in Alberta. Mrs. Jouk in the interview discussed the situation in the Odessa region, mentioned cannibalism, etc. Leslie Collier, one of the Foreign Office officials who had been reading the, and commenting on the dispatches, of which I've quoted only a small portion, Leslie Collier wrote a letter to the Dominion's office explaining how this communication should be answered. I quote, Sir John Simon proposes, Collier was writing in Simon's name, Sir John Simon proposes to reply to the Ukrainian National Council in Canada that His Majesty's government in the United Kingdom cannot undertake any action with a view to investigating conditions in territories under the control of the Soviet government or by organizing relief for the inhabitants. This answer was then dutifully written out by the Office of the High Commissioner in Ottawa and forwarded to the Ukrainian National Council in Canada. The internal correspondence concerning this reply to the Ukrainian National Council in Canada as well as to several other groups which had appealed to London were all headed alleged famine in Ukraine. Now, very quickly to summarize this, to draw some tentative conclusions. It is clear that throughout 1933, the Foreign Office was receiving from its embassy and its consulates weekly and even daily dispatches about the agricultural situation, the internal situation in the USSR and in Ukraine. It is clear from these dispatches that London had a general conception of the Soviet nationalities policies in Ukraine and understood the specific policy that Pavel Posyshev had begun to conduct. London was considerably better informed about the food crisis as a whole in the C entire USSR and the famine in Ukraine, which are two different things, although they're related. However, London saw these two related but not identical matters almost exclusively from an economic point of view and did not see the very close link between Moscow's nationalities, policies, and economic policies. However, the London had absolutely no doubts that a famine was taking place in Ukraine. Uh, Foreign Office officials read dispatches from Moscow and again and again confirmed that they were accepting these dispatches as being correct. However, when Ukrainian organizations in the West appealed to the British government to arrange for some sort of relief, they were told that nothing could be done in regard to the alleged famine. Thank you.